afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this skill webinar series. My name is Amanda Adams. I'm an associate professor at Fresno State. I'm also the director for the master's program in ABA there. And I'm also the director for the Central California Autism Center, which is located at Fresno State. And today I'm talking about a topic for early intervention, very early intervention, um, toddler years before the age of three. We're talking about the possible prevention of receiving the autism diagnosis and some neurological mechanisms that might be partially responsible for the effectiveness of the treatment. So our title is, What if we can present, uh, prevent autism and cases of partially treated autism? So before we start, I just want to clarify a couple of terms. And uh, thank you to my collaborators, Eduardo and Dr. Copeland, uh, both very, very helpful on this presentation. So the first term to clarify is the term high risk for autism. So this is a diagnosis that's commonly received um, when children are before the age of three. Uh, this is not necessarily science-based. It's um, policy where diagnosticians uh, usually are hesitant to provide the full diagnosis of autism until the age of three. So instead of that, when children are showing some signs, they often get um, high risk for autism as a label. Uh, the good news is that we can work with this uh, by starting intervention very early. Uh, the bad news is that it can carry risks later on. But what it usually carries are these features, that we've observed some uh, characteristics of autism. They have uh, failed to meet certain developmental milestones and red flags show, show up on screenings like the MCHAT. Uh, but either because they are young or for other factors, maybe just a severity factor, they don't reach full diagnostic criteria or fail to reach the full diagnosis. And we often see this uh, from younger siblings of children who have uh, been diagnosed with autism already. So we know that there is some genetic component to autism, and the younger siblings of children with autism often are flagged much earlier and receive this high-risk classification. The other term that we need to clarify is partially treated autism. And the first time I've heard this term used is from Dr. Linda Copeland, who is a developmental pediatrician working out of the Sacramento area. She also works part-time in Fresno uh, with the UCSF Medical School program. So her specialty is autism, and by seeing many, many kids over the last uh, few decades, she now is seeing a growing number of children that she's classifying as partially treated autism. And I'd also like to mention that Dr. Copeland is a BCBA, one of the few pediatricians um, who has gone back to obtain her um, credential in uh, behavior analysis, partly because of her specialty in autism. So with partially treated autism, this, this is what we're referring to. The little ones have received some months of early intervention and have done very well. But by the time they're up for reassessment, usually around the age of three, when the school district would formally take over their education, they fail to meet the diagnostic criteria. So this, in some ways, is a celebration because we know that they've made progress. But we know that there's also a serious risk, risk factor for the um, uh, ongoing uh, pre preservation of their treatment program if they haven't met the full diagnostic criteria for autism. So it's possible that they re will receive a diagnosis of PDD, NOS, or pervasive developmental disorder, or possibly some other classification. But in any case, we're at risk for continuing their treatment if they don't receive the full diagnosis. So this is just uh, two terms that we're going to be discussing later, and I wanted to be clear about them from the very beginning keep hitting the mouse and we're just on the computer here. So I am assuming that the audience that I have now um, is largely made up of ABA providers, practitioners, probably experienced with providing early intervention services for some time now, um, maybe also made up of some parents um, who are also familiar with early intervention services in ABA and uh, the possibility of um, others. So I'm making some assumptions with this presentation, one that you are um, somewhat familiar with early intervention and applied behavior analysis. Um, and if I do make too many assumptions throughout the presentation and use some terminology or uh, use examples that are unfamiliar, 
please don't hesitate to record those as questions and send them in later. I'd be happy to address them at the end of the presentation. But I'm going to proceed assuming that there's some basic level of familiarity with these things now. So right now, we're going to turn to the rationale for early intervention for behavior treatment. And uh, we have a load of empirical evidence that shows us that um, starting children very early in intensive behavioral treatment is the best chance they have for a very improved prognosis or recovery at the end of their treatment. We know, we know that we have better outcomes in younger children. Now, there are a variety of reasons for this. One reason is simply that the younger you are, the fewer deficits you have had a chance to um, uh, make up. So we don't have as far to go. If you're only two years old, there's only two years worth of material that you can be behind on. Compared to four years old, we have double the material. So one reason that younger children have better outcomes is simply there are fewer things to make up. So I have a series of graphs to share with you now. And this first graph is just a depiction of typical development. So on the x-axis, going across the bottom of the page, we have the developmental age of a child. And on the y-axis, going up and down, we have the chronological age of a child. So with typical development, it's a straight linear shoot. So if you're two years old, you act like you're two years old. And if you're three years old, you act like you're three years old, and it continues to go. So even with typically developing children, of course, there's some wavering along as we go through um, developmental phases. But for the most part, this is a straight shot. With developmental norms, or developmental delays, we have delayed development even though chronological age continues. Now, I drew these graphs myself, so forgive the imprecision in the artwork. But what we have is a child who continues to age, so they act, they're at three years of age, but they act like they're maybe 18 months. So we have a delayed development in their trajectory. So if I uh, illustrate it with these arrows, we can just see that intervening earlier is better. If we wait till age three or four, we have more uh, skill areas to make up than if we intervene very, very early. Now with intensive treatment, we can start to change the developmental trajectory. Many studies have shown this now. The first that I saw to present a large set of data was a Canadian study. And this may have been because in Canada we have a socialized healthcare system. And uh, many, many children, a very large number of participants were included in this sample size. And they were able to show that overall, the developmental trajectory could change once the children began early intervention. So I have this uh, graph here to show that once early intervention begins, we change the developmental trajectory. So children with an original delay are now learning as fast as their typical peers, which looks like this if they continue that progression of uh, their learning rate um, over time. However, our preferred goal is not that they continue to learn as fast as their peers, but that they close the gap depicted by this final graph here. And if they close the gap, then we need to learn not only as quickly as their typically developing peers, but actually faster than their typically developing peers. So that's really something if you think about taking a child with a developmental delay um, and improve their learning rate, not only to be that of their typical peers, but actually faster than their typical peers. That really takes a lot of time. So this is our rationale for the intensity of the hours that we recommend. There's really no way we're going to be able to achieve something like that unless we work with a child most hours of every day. So this is our rationale for early treatment and intensive treatment. So we have some colleagues um, at CSU Stanislaus that have estimated that to close the gap in such a manner, we need to be presenting about 2,000 learning opportunities a day and that will equate about twice the growth. So in one month's period of time, we're teaching twice the material. And if we are able to continue that kind of a rate, then we may be able to close the gap at a very early age. So there's another reason that intervening very, very early could be better. And this has to do with the concept of brain plasticity, which is probably familiar to most uh, viewers out there right now. We know that in other kinds of neurological abnormalities or in cases of injury like traumatic brain injury, younger brains recover faster and more thoroughly. So we've seen this in brain science, neuroscience for years. 
older brains can recover, but usually have a harder time and may, may demonstrate some remaining skill deficits. It depends on what the nature of the injury is. Now there's some things that we can learn from neuroscience about this and the treatments that we've been doing for years are now supported with some of this science just merging together. Both have developed for a long time um, for years on their own paths and now we see the merge of this evidence coming together. So the one thing that we as behavior analysts can take pride in uh, remembering is that our brain develops as a result of interaction with our environment. And there's really no question neuroscientists uh, support this as well. The more we interact with the environment, the more the neurons in our brain are activated and develop. We also have a typical pruning process that occurs at a very early age, and this occurs as a result of interactions with the environment, repeated interactions that create um, a pattern of neural firing in the brain. And we have a phrase that makes this easy to remember. We say neurons that fire together, wire together. So the things that we practice over and over again became, become part of our behavioral repertoire and help to make our brains the way they actually are. So we have neural networks in our brain and autism is the effect or effects the, uh, the neurology of, uh, of our brains. So this is kind of a chicken and the egg issue, which came first. Uh, but we know that um, autism is primarily a neurological disorder. So neurology is affected by autism or is the effect of a disorganized neural network. So we have what appears to be disorganized or even hairy looking neural networks in the fMRIs of children with autism. And I'll show you these pictures in just a moment. And we also know that uh, behavior analysis and the applied sense for early intervention is really repeated practice of skills um, over and over again, lots of repetition that helps to smooth these neural networks in a sense. So again, the, the neurons that fire together, wire together, and we see as a result more behavior, uh, more organized behavioral patterns. So I'm going to step way back now and merge together about 30 years worth of neurological history. And I'm taking a sample of three different studies. So this is a, this is a, a gross oversight going way back to a study done in the 80s. And then we'll sample from um, two other studies that are more recent and try to tie this all together. But really what I want to show here with this section on neurology is that there is an underlying physi physiological mechanism that we're starting to understand and it provides evidence for um, the results that we've seen for years with the success of early intervention. And it may give us another um, ground to hold on to when we're defending our work. So from the 1970s, there's been a growing body of basic neuroscience, um, research that shows that neuronal cell mechanisms are analogs of classical and operant conditioning. So those in the audience who are well versed in behavior analysis might enjoy this, uh, these next couple of slides. And those of you that haven't had the pleasure of taking um, a learning course um, might, uh, might need to freshen up just a little bit on opera conditioning. But just for a moment here, this is how the basic science has built. So in autism, we, we see that there's not only evidence of a pathology in the brain connectivity along neural pathways, but there's also evidence in the pathology at the individual synaptic level. This is really fascinating. So we have operant and classical conditioning analogs that impact the neurological effic uh, efficiency and efficacy in the brains. So the study that was done in 1984 by um, Hawkins uh, was actually losing, using a marine snail, but he described Nobel award winning learning ability in the snail. So he actually isolated the precise neuron in which he could isolate the classic, the uh, operant conditioning process. So meaning he could show that reinforcement was working and the snail was actually learning from a neuron, from a neurological level to a single neuron. It was really pretty amazing stuff. So his quote that I have uh, captured here says that these results indicate that a mechanism of classical conditioning of the withdrawal reflex is an elaboration of the mechanism underlying sensitization. So the mechanisms of higher order features of learning, such as the effect of contingency, may be built from combinations at the molecular mechanisms of these simple forms of learning. 
That's a very wordy quote, but in essence, he's saying that he can neurologically see the effects of contingency. Contingency is the if-then effect. So we're saying if you touch the right uh, response, then you'll get a certain kind of reinforcer. That's a contingency. And he was able to identify this process at a basic level very early on at the neurological level. This is really exciting evidence of why what we do works so well. So another way of stating this is, in simpler terms, that it's likely when a child with an autism spectrum disorder or developmental delay receives quality intensive um, applied behavior analysis intervention, that neural synaptic efficiency is being impacted via operant conditioning. We know what we do works, and now we know a little bit more about why it works. So the next piece of evidence that I'm borrowing is from our colleagues at UC Davis Mind Institute. And Sally Rogers uh, presented a few years ago on um, images of fMRIs, or functional um, MRIs, that were done on the brains of children with autism, both before and after treatment. So there are several studies. This is a series of uh, research studies that have been done at the Mind Institute. And this is just a sample of their uh, findings. Uh, but we have what looks before the intervention like hairy or disorganized networks in the brain. They look like, uh, you can see the neural synapses and you can see the neural networks and they just look very um, overgrown almost, like a weed bed in a flower garden that's been overgrown. And then after uh, early intervention, it looks as if it's pruned properly or as if this neural network has been weeded out to the extent that you can now see organized networks that look much more typical in the brain. And here's a sample of what, what it might look like. So we have um, this image is a particular, particular um, method of capturing neural networks. And here you can imagine what it would look like for this to be overgrown and then in a sense weeded or pruned back down to this picture, which is a more organized, typical neural network. So a much more recent study now that was published last year in 2012 by Vos and colleagues um, used a, a fairly brief intervention period of just 12 weeks, a combination of uh, behavioral intervention, uh, primarily using PRT techniques, uh, for 12 weeks, so about three months, and we had uh, two groups, a waitlist group and um, an experimental group. And they also examined the fMRIs uh, images of these two groups of children. And what we see, if you look at, at the third bullet point on the screen, is an activation increase in the regions of the brain normally recruited by typically developing children during social interactions. And this was after the treatment. So I'm summarizing this finding it dramatically. So um, I'm skipping a great deal, but uh, the reference is there if you'd like to read the entire article. Um, and then the next finding, in some early intervention recipients, the finding on the fMRI showed a normalization of the brain regions that most typically developing children use during interaction with others. And other children developed new compensatory regions um, in the brain. So again, this is analogous to things that we found in prior brain interventions like traumatic brain injury, that uh, regions of the brain can indeed relearn functions and uh, begin to function in ways that they hadn't prior to the injury, in this case, prior to treatment. So this is a very exciting finding. And uh, this study was presented recently at a conference, and the second author on the study is quoted this way. He says, yet here we are scanning children of about four years of age, and we're seeing that areas we thought had fundamentally failed to develop in children with ASD can be activated with a fairly minimal amount of treatment. This offers up a vast notion of neuronal plasticity that we would not have predicted at the beginning of the study. Findings further suggest that fMRI might eventually allow researchers to predict how well individual children and, uh, with ASD might respond to treatment, as well as help them to design better behavior interventions. So this is a very exciting merger of neuroscience and behavioral science coming together. It doesn't change the way we respond necessarily, but it certainly exp explains some physiological uh, fundamentals of why we see behavior therapy work so well. The repeated practice does seem to impact um, on a neurological level. So I'm gonna pull the conversation back now to toddlers who are at high risk for autism. 
And there's a couple of things to uh, merge these two topics. One is that we know younger brains are more malleable. So the younger the brain is, the, uh, the more plasticity we see with the functions of the neural networks in the brain. The other is that because of their young age, they have fewer skills that are already deficit in their repertoires. So these two factors together indicate that children who are very young and begin early intervention should do very, very well with uh, uh, the, the early diagnosis. So although we've always known that starting young is important, this could be further evidence that starting very young is crucial for best outcomes. Another factor of high risk um, diagnoses is that um, there are very often the younger siblings of children with autism. This is for several reasons. Parents may be more savvy to the warning signs if they are, already have a child diagnosed. They're also already in the system, so uh, rather than having to find school resources and uh, regional center resources if you're in the California area, um, they're already, they've already undergone that process. So the access to treatment for younger siblings can be very, very quick. And uh, unfortunately, that's not always the case for the first child in the family who might demonstrate signs of autism. We know that there's, there are genetic factors with autism, and we're seeing more and more sibling pairs. So some of the uh, ability to do this research with um, high-risk autism has come from younger siblings that have been diagnosed. There are a couple of things to keep in mind now when we're developing treatments for um, children at high risk for autism. Some things are different than um, children who come in with a full diagnosis of autism already. So first of all, since they're very, very young, the hour recommendation may be slightly reduced. Rather than 30 to 40 hours a week, we might be looking at 20 to 25 hours a week. This has to do with a few things, um, one of them being that they still often nap. And a, a toddler, sometimes they're beginning before the age of two, probably still needs to take a nap, um, and also is just developmentally not quite ready for the intensity of a, an eight-hour learning day. But a four-hour learning day, still quite intense for one of that, uh, that young age, is going to be very, very effective. So we're still talking about four to five days a week, um, four to five hours a day. So many hours a day, most days of the week. Um, and this is just the formal training. Of course, there's still incidental training going on outside of that formal um, intervention. The other slight difference is that the skills that we target should be very developmentally aligned. Um, and of course, with all treatment of kids with autism, we do a careful job of making sure that we're uh, watching developmental markers and trying to stay um, where we're matching treatment to that of typically developing peers. However, with children of this age, it may be even more important to carefully monitor what's developmentally typical and make sure that we're developing skills in all areas of their uh, growth that are developmentally typical. So with those things in mind, we're going to move on to um, our own preliminary investigation. And this study was done at the Central California Autism Center at Fresno State. And I'll thank uh, Eduardo Avalos, who is the lead um, investigator on the study at the center. The purpose of this really was to examine the sibling pairs that we had coming into the center. We were seeing very many cases of younger siblings of children who already carried an autism diagnosis who were being referred for very early work. Some of these were much before the age of two even. And uh, this, was, this was quite early. We were very curious to see what would happen with the prognosis of children coming in this early. So we looked at this in accordance with a number of outcome variables. So this particular study, which should be considered preliminary, um, looked at four sibling dyads. Um, we had seven males and one female. Um, all high-risk siblings were younger than their autistic siblings. The age range at assessment was between 20 months and five and a half years of age. That was for the sibling pairs. Um, all participants were treated in the same early intervention center at to Fresno State. Um, each participant consistently received between 20 to 40 hours of ABA therapy per week in their first year of treatment. And high-risk participants were defined as having a formal diagnosis of a developmental delay or having an older sibling diagnosed with autism and having an older sibling diagnosed. 
and no participants in this study had a comorbid diagnosis. So we did a variety of assessment procedures that are standardized and um, accepted by our uh, funding sources in this case. And the outcome variables that were measured included this list of things at the bottom of the screen here. Uh, the learning acquisition of specific skills mastered per quarter, the cumulative skills per quarter, prevention or loss of autism diagnosis, the average age at the termination of treatment, the average treatment period before exiting, and the average age at start of treatment. These are among the variables we examined. So here in a nutshell are three results that we thought were important to uh, consider. First result is that, that the children at high risk for autism had a 100% prevention rate of being diagnosed with autism by the age of three. So the sibling counterparts uh, had a zero rate of, being, um, of losing their diagnosis. However, 75% of them were included in typical classrooms with no supports and doing very well. 38% um, of the other children in the autism program um, at Fresno State, so the peers of the uh, older siblings, did meet graduation criteria at the end of treatment. So result number two, uh, there was a generally positive relationship between the earlier start of treatment and the positive treatment outcomes. So if we compare just the age at the start of treatment, the autism uh, group average start age was 48 months and the high risk sibling start group is 22 months. So we're looking at almost half, uh, less than half the age at the start rate for um, our early intervention treatment. There was the third result here was treatment length and the sibling group that had a formal diagnosis of autism they had an average length of 34 months of treatment and the high risk group had an average length of 11 and a half months of treatment just short of one year and the average age at treatment termination for the autism sibling group the average age was seven and for the high risk group the average age was three and i should mention that our our termination criteria is not a lack of diagnosis, but is the ability to function in a general ed classroom or other educational classroom with no supports at a level considered um, uh, to, to be able to learn from your typical environment. So uh, it's not only the diagnosis, but also the ability at level of the child on, on um, exit criteria examination. So here are a few graphs to go along with those findings. The high-risk siblings, uh, the cumulative acquisition in the first year here, we started with about 100 skills, just uh, learning unit skills, and ended up with uh, between 500 and 1,000 skills. This was the high-risk group. For the um, sibling group that had a diagnosis of autism, we see that they started about the same, a little higher in some cases. The learning trajectory rate is what really is different between these two groups. In the high-risk group, I'll go back a slide, you see a very sharp increase in learning acquisition that continues over a year. And in the sibling group, the siblings who are already diagnosed with autism, we see a little bit of a leveling off with the, with the acquisition. Now these are cumulative graphs, so it means we're continuing to count the number of skills. So one thing to keep in mind is that as children are older, as these children were, the skills get a little bit more difficult. So we would expect that there would be a leveling off in the sharp increase in acquisition number of skills. So we still see some increase, but not as dramatic as the um, high-risk group. And here is a group, uh, group average rate of the same information. So the blue line is showing the high-risk sibling group, a very sharp increase of skills, then leveling off a little bit. And the high, the, um, the sibling group already diagnosed with autism depicted by the green line, not as fast um, an, autism, uh, an acquisition rate. These next three graphs are the ones that I think make the, make the biggest, most dramatic point. And here we see the percent of participants that lost or failed to obtain an autism diagnosis. So the, the tall blue bar is representing the high-risk sibling group um, in which 100% of these children failed to obtain the autism diagnosis at age three when they were reassessed. Um, and with these particular four siblings, we, none of them uh, lost their diagnosis. 
but in their peer group, other people, uh, other children who are being treated at the center, we have about uh, 38 or 40 percent, close to 40 percent of that group who did lose their diagnosis for autism. Now here we have months of treatment received before exiting the program and the age at the start of early intervention between each group of children. So the green bars are the siblings already diagnosed with autism and the blue bar is the group for younger siblings at high risk. So we see here much higher uh, lengths of treatment and also older ages in the group uh, already diagnosed with autism who began at around four years of age. And the age of exiting treatment. Um, we have almost seven years of age for the sibling group and um, three years of age for the high risk group. So this is showing us, none of this is really surprising. This is what we would have expected in the beginning, looking at the study, that if we're, we're receiving children earlier into early intervention, then it will, it will require less work, we'll see more dramatic results, and we'll see them faster. And that's, those are the findings that we saw. So a summary of these results, children at high risk for autism were treated with 20 to 20, 30, 20 to 30 hours of early intervention around the age of 23 months and all failed to receive the autism diagnosis and they were fully included in preschool programs with no need of further support. The time period needed to exit treatment with older siblings with autism was triple to that, to the exit of high risk sibling counterparts and the age of treatment exit was double in the autism sibling group compared to the high risk sibling group. So if we just tie this information together, we have some preliminary evidence for um, some of the patterns that we are seeing now. We know that early intervention for, um, treat for children is more effective the earlier we're able to provide it. Um, high risk for autism has um, the possibility of resulting in the prevention of a diagnosis of autism. Of course, it's impossible to say whether these children would or would not have received the autism diagnosis uh, had they not been treated early. But we do know that this uh, uh, finding at least gives us some evidence for a good prognosis if we do go ahead and begin. Uh, when we're talking to parents or educators, another thing to remember is that really what this treatment amounts to is being in a super duper preschool. Um, it's not invasive, we're not doing anything aversive or um, traumatic to the children. It's just like going to a preschool program, but a preschool program that's highly goal-directed and presents many, many learning opportunities. So um, even in the case that uh, if, if we were to make the argument that these children would not have developed autism um, anyway, uh, we, we haven't done any harm. In fact, we've just uh, pro um, made sure that they're ready to go into kindergarten at the top of their class. So um, this matches up with other neurological evidence that we're finding, and we might be able to merge the evidence of um, fMRI research into these um, treatment findings and see that what we're doing lines up very well. We may have another way of uh, providing evidence for the efficacy of early intervention with these. So if we step back a little bit to application, that was just a little bit on neuroscience and trying to understand what's happening in the brain. We step back and remember that the brain is a result of interactions with the environment. That's what we actually are made up of. Um, every time we encounter a stimulus in the environment, something happens in the brain, and that continued interaction ends up creating the neural networks that we have and results in our behavioral repertoires. So, Looking at that, one way we might define success of treatment for children with autism is simply the ability to learn independently from your natural environment. That's really the end goal of early intervention um, in uh, no matter what form it comes in. So if we borrow, if you're, if you're able to accept that uh, definition for a moment now, we can use that to work with um, the next section of the presentation. So the caution with this is um, getting very, very excited about having um, a child turn three and not be diagnosed with autism. And at first, that seems like a reason to celebrate. Then we must have done a good job. He doesn't have autism. Whew, we're ready to go. Uh, but we know, especially those of you that have worked in the field for a long time, that this might be a very big concern, actually, 
So we know that neuroscience and behavioral science are lining up, but we also know, unfortunately, that science and public policy do not align. And this is where our concern comes in. Now, in the interest of time today, I'm not going to spend a lot of time addressing policies um, that also may differ from state to state. Um, but sometimes we know that um, treatment funding can be threatened um, at age three when uh, education becomes a responsibility of school districts and also depending on state to state where the funding for this treatment is coming from. So public policy we know no matter where you are does not always pay attention to science in fact rarely so. So um, the excitement of these findings unfortunately now make, needs to make its way back into public policy. So we have clues of what's happening, but of course we're very far from understanding the complete picture. We have lots more research to do and a long way to go before we really can put together all of the pieces of this puzzle. And unfortunately the information that we do already have is not being used very well in many cases. I want to make a quick important note because as I proceed here, we'll be talking about high risk um, and partially treated autism. And um, we did note that in our particular study that I just reviewed, all four participants um, failed to receive the diagnosis of autism and the exit from the program was determined not only on this, but also by their ability to function in a preschool setting with no further supports from the treatment team. I want to point out a couple of things that they started at a very young age, 20, as, as early as 20 months. So they started be before the age of two. And also that we had a very careful curriculum that we used um, that was extensively and developmentally normed. Um, we used a combination of the skills and the ables. Um, many children begin, unfortunately, only slightly before the age of three, not well before the age of three. And although they make dramatic progress, they may not have made such progress as to no longer uh, require any additional supports. So I just wanted to add that caveat before proceeding here. Because we know that the crucial transition in, in early intervention, early intervention, is um, turning three years old. This is almost um, something that can be ant uh, anticipated with some um, nervousness on the part of families when we're coming up to the three-year-old evaluation. So as I already stated, the funding source may change, and uh, we also uh, often encounter diagnosticians who now feel, finally feel comfortable providing the full recommendation or the full diagnostic workup of autism or not once the child turns three. And I might note that this is not necessarily supported by science, but it's um, a habit that many diagnosticians have gotten into of only providing a full diagnosis of autism at the age of three. So. Um, Failing to receive an autism diagnosis may also uh, remove or prevent the funding of a program in some cases. So we really do want to be sure that we have done a very careful job of this. So I'm going to move the discussion now to the notion of partially treated autism. And as I mentioned, this was a term that I've just recently started hearing, but it's a, um, a situation that we're encountering more and more in the Central Valley of California. I imagine many, many other places as well. So um, in this case, we may have had um, a diagnosis of PDD NOS or pervasive developmental disorder. Um, but in many cases, that diagnosis is not sufficient to maintain the funding of a treatment program. This does not mean that they've completed their treatment. Failing to receive the full diagnosis is not the same as being complete, as being finished with your treatment program. It's a very important distinction to make. And this is where we're seeing the issue come up with partially treated autism. So the child may very well have remaining deficits that require further intervention in order for them to be successful long-term in their natural learning environments. This is our big concern. So um, if, we, if we're considering the neural um, impact that our treatment has had, then I'd like to draw an analogy here. And I've put it here that I put it here that partially treated autism could be considered like this. The neural network has begun to change and prune into a more organized, efficient system, but it has not yet progressed to the point of enabling the individual to independently learn from their environment. So consider this analogy. If, um, if you had a broken arm and went to uh, get it set by a doctor, 
no one would question that you needed to keep the cast on until the bone was thoroughly healed. This seems very common sense to us. So if the doctor gave you a checkup to see if the bone was beginning to heal, and in fact it was beginning to heal. So if we said, is your arm still broken? We would say, no, it's actually not broken any longer, but we're not yet ready to take the cast off. The doctor might say something like, hmm, it's healing nicely, but we're not quite ready until the bone is thoroughly healed to remove the cast. Now, how much more complex is our brain? If we're just beginning to heal a neural network or build the neural network that will be successful in the natural environment, we certainly can't remove treatment before the process is finished. So this um, graphical representation may show something that we're looking at. So if you see that we have an input layer, connections going into something they consider hidden layers in our neural network, and then coming out to an output layer. This is very, very complex in the human brain. And somewhere here, we're not quite done fixing and practicing all of the neural networks that are going to be required. So with partially treated autism, the behavior analyst should take the role of the doctor in this case and say something along the lines of, hmm, coming along nicely, but we aren't finished treating this quite yet. This is a, a caution that we feel is very important. So the continued treatment we know can close the gap of children who are doing well, but yet still lack certain skills before they move on to uh, independent learning. So it's not only best practice, but it's ethical practice to continue treatment um, if warranted, of course, by good assessment, despite the lack of receiving a diagnosis of autism. So I have a few recommendations and tips now on what we need to do to prevent partially treated autism. And one thing is to be aware of splinter skills. So people who have been practicing ABA for a long time or have been involved in early intervention for a long time are familiar with the concept of splinter skills. These are skills that uh, children exceed in. They're very, very good in a, in a couple of areas and the skills splinter up and uh, appear to be very, very strong in the child's repertoire. However, in very young children, this might mask the um, continuation of other deficits and we have to be very careful that um, excellent splinter skills aren't masking overall deficits that still remain. So if we're examining the developmental norms in a variety of domains that are crucial for a child's development, we'll be better apt to uh, make sure we catch these things and not make a, a mistake of early, ending treatment too early. So one recommendation is to use a curriculum guide, such as the skills. And the skills isn't the only uh, tool you can use, but it's an excellent tool because of its precision and the amount of detail that it goes into, and because it's developmentally normed, it will help a practitioner ensure that the deficits and concerns across all areas are addressed before they make the decision or recommendation to terminate treatment. So a little bit more on splinter skills. Um, the strong skills that might help a child present as though they do not meet autism criteria. Um, these are our concerning areas. And these are things that we usually celebrate as uh, parents and practitioners. We're very, very proud of the advances that a child has made. Um, sometimes in the area of social skills, um, they're very charming and a smile and good eye contact and the ability to, re to respond to a greeting might throw a new diagnostician off the mark. The, the child might look so advanced in these areas that they may miss some other remaining deficits. Now it's true that these children may not meet the full diagnostic criteria for autism, but the, the splinter skill should not be mistaken for complete recovery. So we need to be careful. Practitioners should attend to these deficit areas closely because these could be the weak spots in the complete skill repertoires needed for typical learning in the future. So consider this as making sure that the bone is completely healed or making sure that our, our uh, neural network in this case is to the point that's needed for complete independent learning going on in the future. So if we go back, remember the chart that I presented a few minutes ago on developmental norms. So good BCBAs always individualized curriculum and very young children and toddlers um, still of course require individualized curriculum and they are individuals. Some will have strengths and areas that others do not. 
but partly because of their age, they are going to be more uniform in the um, areas of their deficits and therefore in the needs for their treatment. So it's even more important when we're dealing with children under the age of three to pay attention to developmental norms and to be sure that in every area of developmental um, activity, we're addressing the needs that the child may have. So we're talking about social, cognitive, um, uh, emotional relatedness, social skills, and academic skills all across the board. So be careful to program for all develop, uh, developmental areas um, evenly. And if we do get splinter skills, we can recognize those and enjoy those, but make sure that they are not masking other underlying deficits. So in summary, very young children under 32 months of age are more likely to be identified as high risk for autism rather than receiving the full diagnosis of autism. And the success of an early intervention behavior therapy program is well documented, but recent findings are suggesting even more dramatic and positive outcomes for children who are very young. Um, we also have fMRI evidence now that shows neurological improvement that parallels the behavioral improvement for children in programs with autism spectrum disorders. Unfortunately, public policy makes turning three a bit precarious for many children. So improvements as the result of being in early intervention before the age of three may make receiving the full diagnosis of autism at the age of three less likely. Um, symptoms have improved, the child is doing very well and does not present with characteristics that will meet the full diagnostic criteria. However, in some cases, this will be considered partially treated autism, not fully recovered from autism. So the final recommendations that I have for you this afternoon are that BCBAs or early interventionists, educators, program directors, parents, all those involved in the beginning um, recommendations for a child's treatment program need to push for more complete insurance coverage policies. And that's just a little note I'm throwing in there. We don't have time to talk about that a great deal. Also, we need to educate others about partially treated autism and that possibility and make sure that we do not pull therapy programs too soon. We need to use extensively um, and developmentally normed criteria and assessments to make sure that our curricula that we're using ensure that splinter skills are not masking other deficits. The skills is one such curricular tool. Um, its level of detail helps to ensure that a practitioner will catch these concerning areas of develop development. And we also need to be sure that we report to funding agencies or in IEPs or in other uh, reports that might carry future implications for a child's treatment area um, and be careful to make sure that we capture the remaining needs for a treatment uh, with a child. So in conclusion, uh, the advances in neuroscience and behavioral science are very exciting. They may result in a more complete understanding of the neurological improvements that occur as a result of early intervention uh, work that we do. And we know what works, but we need to stay tuned for future results. So thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate you joining uh, us today. And I believe we have a few minutes for questions. So if you do have questions, please um, send them along and we'll look. So the first question I have here is, what was the reference for the learning opportunities number? The, the reference for that was um, coming from Colleen Sparkman, who is the co-director for Therapeutic Pathways um, at the Kindle School in, uh, in Turlock. Um, very small, tiny little town in the middle of California, but an excellent school. Um, and they've equated about, this was just a rough estimate pulled from their own data, but it was about 2,000 learning opportunities a day that they suggested would be the mark we hit in order to hint that um, double learning um, rate for children who are catching up to developmental norms. The next question I have is, will you please speak to the concern of a lost opportunity for an autism diagnosis for children who receive early intervention prior to being diagnosed, given that once they are of age to receive an official diagnosis, they may not qualify? 
Yes, I think I addressed this a little bit more at the end of the presentation. And uh, losing the diagnosis is a bigger concern because of public policy. This really is where science and public policy diverge. The loss of, uh, of a diagnosis um, is actually good news, clinically speaking, but is bad news when it comes to um, receiving funding for um, for a therapy program. So if funded by the regional center, like many programs are here in California, this is a bigger concern. If the child's program was funded by an insurance company, which is happening more and more places around the country, this is less of a concern because most insurance companies are not requiring the diagnosis of full autism in order to insure the program. So this really does come down to a funding issue in many cases. Um, otherwise, if funding were not an issue, then um, it's up to the diagnostician and other professionals involved uh, the, treat, treating the individual to be sure that we complete the treatment course. So, um, and if I didn't address that clearly enough, please uh, email again and see if I can clarify. So the next question I have is, is I said that high risk siblings had 100% no autism diagnosis at age three. Did they have any other diagnoses? No, they did not. They um, um, had completely lost any diagnosis of all. No PDD, um, no developmental delay, no language um, referral at all. So um, any concern was completely removed from those four that we had in our sample, in our study. And has there been any follow-up data looking at long-term for high-risk autism kids? This is an excellent question, and um, I am not familiar with any yet, although we are in the process of obtaining these data so we can uh, bring those along with our study that we already have completed and see if we can add to it. Um, we're, we'd also like to pool with other agencies that have uh, information on high-risk treatment and look at our follow-up statistics to see how the children are doing later on. Our suspicion with these, uh, since we are in touch with the families, is that they're doing quite well. But no, we do not yet have published data on this, and it's a need for ongoing research. And we're looking at cost analyses. The next question that I'm receiving has to do with um, the cost analysis. This is an excellent question also and really might, might affect public policy down the road. Um, this is another growing area of research. A lot of work still remains to be done in this, um, in this particular area. And associating um, the cost factors of early intervention, very early intervention, you know, before the age of three, um, is something that might well impact public policy down the road. We do not have any um, statistical information on this yet. It's another very big need for us as we as we move forward. So um, the next question that I have. Did the high-risk sibling participants lose their developmental delay diagnosis? Yes, yes, um, in our particular sample, they did. However, we have had uh, two other younger siblings who did not participate in this study. One came into our program much, much earlier, a couple of years before we considered doing this study, and then another since we've completed the study. Um, one, the one that we received a couple of years ago did not have as favorable an outcome as the four that we um, were able to observe in this particular study. He already had the full-blown autism diagnosis when we uh, started working with him before the age of three, which is a little bit unusual, but in that case it was a, a severe enough diagnosis. Um, so in our particular sample size, you know, we, we had no remaining developmental delay. And the next question, um, do we know the average ASD diagnosis is in the United States? I do not know that, but I will look into some information and um, I can post this and share the information back with uh, the skills uh, researchers here. We can look into that, but the average age of ASD diagnosis, if anybody watching happens to know that information, please chime in and send it along. Um, I'm, I'm going to venture a guess that around the age of three to four, between the age of three and four, is the most common we see in our practice. Um, that does not speak to average rates around the United States. That's just what I'm familiar with. Um, so we will look into that further and get back to you. Very good question. And a final, I believe a final, let's see here, question I have is, uh, other curriculums or assessments that we recommend? Um, any 
any complete um, assessment that is developmentally normed will help with younger children. Now, normally, um, developmental norms are not something that I continue to push or emphasize a great deal, especially for older kids. Not that it's unimportant. It always is, to some degree, important. But criteria normed um, skills assessments are also very, very important, especially with older kids. With the little, little ones, I think the developmental norms are more important um, because we're looking to equalize skill sets at a very early age and um, compensating with some skills for other skills is more of a risk for very, very young children. We also have fewer skills to make up, again, to reiterate that point. So if we're looking at across the board to make sure that our treatment has been um, equal, and even in the way that we're evaluating um, deficits, then, then this is very uh, important. So other tools would be uh, developmentally normed things such as the, the Vineland or the HELP. Um, the, the issue with these is that they're uh, very, very good assessments, but not necessarily very good curriculum tools. So um, that's, that is the difference that uh, I make there. You can use a set of tools together though, such as developmentally normed assessments, and then other good curricular tools and put all of these resources together, and you can uh, make up uh, the information that would, uh, that would equate something like the skills offers. Um, there are other good tools out there, um, by all means. Um, just having to pull all of this information together would take a skilled practitioner. It's entirely possible to do. Just be sure that the developmental norms are, are being assessed and that the gross assessment tools being used accompany a very good detailed curriculum tool um, or somebody able to break those skills down at a deeper level. So I believe that's all the time we have today. And I thank you for your attention and for joining us and encourage you to continue to um, submit questions and we will get back to you. The uh, email for ongoing conversation here is info at skillsglobal.com. Again, that's info at skillsglobal.com. And thank you so much for your attention. Have a good afternoon.